Welcome to our latest Book Reporter Talks to Interview, where our guest today is Alex George, and we're going to be talking about his new book, The Paris Hours. Now, I first came across Alex's work back when he published The Good American back in 2012. And I want you to know, I went into the office this weekend to pick up my hardcover copy from my bets on shelf to bring home for this interview. I still think when somebody says he's a good American, I still think of this book because it was what that character was striving to be. I want to be a good American person. So it's now I have read The Paris Hours, which I finished this morning, and I finished it this morning for a reason, because everyone has said the ending is stupendous, and they are right. So I'm on my um, end of reading high as I'm sitting talking to Alex today, and we're going to get into that. In addition to being an author, because, you know, that's just not enough to be these days, Alex is also a bookseller, a director of a literary festival, and a lawyer. Okay, so there's three, three jobs. He was also born in England. He now lives in Columbia, Missouri, and we clearly have a lot to talk about. So welcome, Alex. Thanks for joining us today. Hi, Carol. It's great to be here. Thank you for having me. So the Paris Hours is set over the course of a single day in the summer of 1927. So what drew you to that timing and that very tight framed period of just 24 hours? So the, what drew, drew me to the timing was actually, um, I, this was not the book that I thought I was going to write when I set out um, to write it. Uh, it. It all began actually one evening when I was driving in my car listening to NPR and there was some music playing and it was a Ravel piece. Uh, and at the end of the piece, the NPR announcer was talking about um, about the music and was talking about how it had been commissioned by the Russian impresario Serge Diaghilev, who ran Les Ballets Russes, this very famous um, ballet company in Paris. Uh, and then, and they were talking about all of the, the geniuses that, that Diaghilev sort of, uh, employed. So he would have Ravel and Stravinsky would write music and Marc Chagall would paint the backdrops and Coco Chanel would design Ooh. the costumes. And I just sat in my car going, well, there's my next book. Uh, that's just, that's amazing. And so I, that was, so that was really what drew me to the period of the twenties. It was, I mean, just after the war, Paris was, I mean, the place to be for lots of reasons. And, and, and I think that the, the country was recovering from the sort of the, the horrors of, of World War One. And one of the things that that meant was that there was this incredible explosion of creativity and so I really wanted to explore that and so I sort of jumped into the research I had a final time imagining that I was going to write this book about Serge Diaghilev but then after a while I realized that um uh you if you if you listen to a Ravel melody or you look at a Marc Chagall painting um the art sort of speaks for itself mm -hmm. they really they really sort of don't need me uh, to tell their story for them. They, they sort of tell their own story. Um, and I began to wonder whether I would actually ever be able to do justice to these extraordinary people who, had also, who were collaborating in this way. Uh, and so I redrew the focus of the book entirely. And so rather than talk about all these very well-known artists, I instead I decided to focus on four individuals and so the book although it's a novel is really four stories mm -hmm. told in sort of strictly rotating chapters of these four characters and they are for want of a better word just ordinary people they are not well known mm -hmm. uh, and there are still some famous people in the book who sort of flit in and out but they're very much on the periphery of the thing uh, so that was why 1920s paris really sort of appealed to me was 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 that an initial thing with with sort of morris Ravel and the music um and I and as, as as far as your question about structure goes, I have no idea why I thought that was a good idea to set it over the course of one day. And during the course of writing it, on many occasions, I was going, "What was I thinking? Why am I doing this?" Um, but it was a it was it was a real challenge because in addition to having this these four chapters going in strict rotation, they also went chronologically over the course of this day. So um, there was a lot of sort of um, sort of banging my head against the wall, trying to sort of corral all these pieces so that it actually made sense and there weren't a sort of a glitch in the space-time continuum halfway through and you sort of suddenly jump backwards. Uh, so it was very hard to do, but there's, there is a theory that the more constraints that you place on yourself, as a, whether you're writing a book or painting a picture or doing whatever, um, it actually releases other parts of your brain 
to be more creative because you're you're constrained in a particular way and so the sort of ideas come out in a different way i don't know whether or not that happened here but but it was certainly an interesting exercise and i and i really i enjoyed it very much uh, although it was occasionally frustrating and i think it was I, I mean i hope it was worth it no it was it was but I, at any point did you think maybe you should make this a weekend maybe it shouldn't just be 24 hours maybe it should go over a course of a weekend you know and i need yeah, more yeah. hours you know on, on multiple occasions i thought this is way too much trouble more trouble than it's worth but but in the end i'm glad i stuck at it well the time of paris is alive with art and music and writing and so much more and i just felt like the bold creativity that was going on in the backdrop of what was happening in the rest of the book was something that was drawing me in as I was reading. So I could picture how it was drawing you in as you were writing. And I found myself thinking of the Paris wife and yes. of the Paris wife and um, Whitney shares the age of light. Yes. They were both set during that same time period. And mm -hmm. I felt like it was a time where the city was so alive. And I think that also at a time right now where things are so quiet, I think that reading about the, um, the excitement that's going on in Paris and the people wandering the streets and what's going on. It's just been so much fun to do. Yeah, I think that's right. And I think that a lot of people have picked the book up because they sort of see Paris in the title and they, they want to escape. Mm -hmm. uh, and, it, you know, there's a sort of geographical escape because you're going across the Atlantic, but there's also the, the time, you know, you're going to a different time as well. So I think it's provided an outlet for, for, for that, for, for yeah. sure. And was it always the title was always the Paris Hours or did that, I usually ask that later, but I'm just curious. Uh, well, no, I mean, the, always with my books, the title comes at the very end. Okay. Uh, we had, um, I mean, the, 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 the text had been finished, the copy edits had been done and, and, you know, my editor was going, all right, now we need a title. And we've been here before, she and I, we, many times we've gone around with other books and, um, uh, and, and it was uh, it was really hard. I mean, I don't like naming my books. Uh, one day I'm going to begin a book knowing what the title, the title is, um, but <laughs> not yet. Anyway, uh, so it, it it came along fairly near the end. Yeah. Well, there's there's a problem with that too. There's one best selling author whose name I will not name, but it's a thriller author, and she wrote the whole book thinking that this was going to be the title. And another best-selling thriller author came out with an announcement of her book coming out with the exact same title and then had to retitle it. And we were in Tucson last year, not this year, last year. And we were talking about, I have to come up with another title. I have 48 hours. And it was really funny. So there was the title at the beginning. And, you know, so the best, the best laid plans, the best laid plans. <laughs> so and the title is absolutely perfect because you're dropped right into that time frame. Okay, so we've got four different people. So tell us about them and why you selected each of them, because they all work for all kinds of different reasons. So, uh, so right, so four people. So uh, the first one, or the, the going in no particular order, is a painter called Guillaume, who is down on his luck. He's, I think, probably not a very good painter, um, but he's, because uh, he doesn't sell very many paintings. Um, he, and he has borrowed some money. Uh, from some thugs and is on the run from them because he needs to pay them back and he doesn't have the money that he needs. And there's also, uh, he's also, there's a, a case of unrequited love and there's this woman who he met once a long time ago and has been sort of watching ever since. Um, there is uh, a, a journalist called Jean-Paul who um, is obsessed with America uh, and he uh, interviews American expatriates of whom there are many in 1927 uh, in Paris. Uh, and so through him, we meet people like um, uh, Josephine Baker and Ernest Hemingway and Gertrude Stein. Um, and, and he tells these stories because he has a story of his own that is actually too painful for him to tell. Uh, and then there is a, an Armenian puppeteer called Soren, who um, is a refugee from the Armenian genocide. Uh, and he performs puppet shows every day in the public squares of Paris, uh, but he performs them in Armenian rather than in French. Uh, and one of the fun things was the, the understanding that children don't really care what language puppet shows are in. They understand exactly what is going on, irrespective of the language that's involved. Um, and then the final character is um, called Camille, and uh, she was the maid or the fictional maid of, of Marcel Proust, the writer. Uh, and and really the story began with her because uh, I was reading as part of my research that I was telling you about about 1927 and all the all of the the, the creative geniuses that were going on. I, I was reading a lot about Proust, 
um, who actually died in 1922. Um, and and uh, Proust's uh, actual maid uh, is called Celeste Albrey, and she wrote a memoir. Um, and in the course of this memoir, which I was reading, she tells about um, an episode where Proust asks him, asks her, excuse me, to burn 32 notebooks that had the, the bones of his masterwork in search of lost time. And I just couldn't get that out of my head. The idea, and she did it. She just, she burned them all. Um, uh, and so it gave me mild palpitations just thinking about it. And, um, you know, one of the jobs of a novelist is to sort of ask what if uh, and sort of think of you know, where I would say we're like magpies. We're looking around always for shiny objects to pick up and sort of put in our put in our stories. And that was one. And I thought about these these this burning of manuscripts or the burning of the notebooks. And I just thought, well, what if she had saved uh, one of those notebooks for herself? Uh, and really, that was the seed from which this whole story began was that that question about what would have happened if she had saved saved a notebook for this one little piece of the treasure one piece of this you know the treasure hunt which part did she have you know at the start they all seem like they're random people and then the tentacles start coming together of how they're all coming together and what's going on there was it clear to you from the start how they were all going to intersect or was it Oh my gosh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I wish I'm guessing the answer. <laughs> I wish I could tell you, Carol, that the whole thing was plotted out before I put a word on paper, but I that is not how I work. Uh I, I, I write very organically, which is a polite way of saying chaotically. <laughs> uh, and, and I just like I just set off. And I, I had these four characters in mind. At, at one point there were five, and I sort of thought, well, that's too many. And so uh, so I just, I just began and I would write sort of four or five chapters of one character at a time mm -hmm. and then then swap and then do some more. Um, so the, the order that the book appears on now has no relation whatsoever to the order in which I actually wrote it. Uh, and I almost literally shuffled the pieces together um, once, once it was all done. Um, so I don't know, I forgot what the question was. So it was with the start, it's clear that you did not know that you were, oh, yeah. <laughs> it's yeah, clear. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I, I didn't really know. And, 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 I, and it was, but it was fun to sort of, to, to, to weave the stories together just in little ways in the way that somebody would leave a flower on a grave and then a little bit later on, somebody else would be walking past and would see that, see that flower. So little things like that. Uh, but I knew that at the end, inevitably is sort of the, uh, the old thing about if there is a, a gun on the wall in scene one, it has to go off by in scene three. Uh, so I, everyone sort of understands that they're going to they're going to somehow at the end converge. Um, uh, and so I, I and I sort of had a vague set, but but I very much I'm sort of writing this over the course of several years and just finding out for myself exactly how that's going to happen. You do um, what you're gonna do, yeah. Yeah, it's uh, it's fun and a little nerve wracking. I mean, there are times when I do wish that I had the clearer sense in my mind. But when I have in the past tried to write books and have a very clearly defined plot, I mean, I go I go off piste within you know a few pages. So it's that's just the way I the way. Not I your style. Think. It's just not your style. You know? <laughs> you know, guilt is a common theme for each of these characters. Each one has guilt layered in somewhere along the way. They have something to hide. Um, did, was that a plan to have everybody battling or did that something that just happened organically as well? It, it kind of did. I mean, I, I didn't, I, I sort of, in the very vaguest sense, I knew that I wanted to have all of the characters being in search of something. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and I mentioned Proust before, you know, his, his, work, his novel is called In Search of Lost Time and that could be taken as the, the overarching theme of the book because mm -hmm. all four of these characters uh, there, there are flashbacks throughout the book, and so you get a lot of their backstory that way. And they have all lost something, mm -hmm. um, and they are all, in their different ways, trying to get back to that. Uh, some more successfully than others. So, so that was an overarching theme that I sort of wanted to work into it all. Um, but you know, I wish I again, it, it's not very scientific the way that I do these things. I, you know, I, I just cast around and as I said there was a fifth character who just wasn't working for me so um, it, it, it's very much sort of throwing, up, throwing it up against the wall and see, seeing what sticks. <laughs> see what works and goes from there. So have you read In Search of Lost Time? Not all of it, 
not all of it. I have, I, I've read the, the first, first volume of seven, uh, so I have a fair way to go. But, um, but I enjoyed it enormously. And what no one ever tells you is that Proust is actually quite funny. Um, and I, I enjoyed it very much. So I'm, I mean, now that I'm a bookseller, I don't really have time to read anything. I, well, you know how this is. Carol. I think it's coming up. You have to yeah, just read ahead. You cannot go back. One must right. go ahead. You, you know, must go forward. But um, but I will at some point. And you would think that the pandemic would be a perfect opportunity to catch up on things, but uh, apparently not if you're also publishing a book during a pandemic. Because and also if you're a bookseller during a pandemic, which we will get into later. You know, but the book is not without its moments of whimsy and humor. And back to Proust for a minute, I like Camille telling him that his sentences were too long. Do you yes. agree with her? I love that lie. The yeah. sentences were too I mean, long. I mean, they are. They go on and on and on. Uh, and it can be, you know, the, the one thing I, I occasionally when I'm reading will get bumps on my nose because I'll be lying in bed and uh, it drives my wife crazy and I fall asleep and the book falls onto my nose. Uh, and particularly <laughs> with Proust, because the, those senses, they, I mean, they're very long uh, and you really have to concentrate. And so at the end of a long day, <laughs> it can be a struggle. So, but um, they're, 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 they are long, but they are absolutely worth the, uh, worth the effort. And the, the, um, the translation that I read was by, um, oh, what's she called? She's Lydia, oh, I can't remember. Um, what is her name? Lydia Millet, I think. No, that's not right. There's a different Lydia. <laughs> we'll have to do that again. Notes. We'll figure it out and put it in the show notes. <laughs> so which character was the easiest to write? Was there one? Um, I think that Soren was probably the easiest one to write mm -hmm. because the story of his escape from uh, the genocide almost told itself mm -hmm. um, it was so it, it felt you know no, normally when I write it's a little bit like getting blood out of a stone and it's every sort of packing away and it's very hard but that story just sort of just came out of me um, and you know he is a, a particularly tragic figure um, and 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 I just and I did enjoy the, the the with the puppets and all of those things. So so he um, he was certainly he's not not necessarily my favourite character. I, I don't know that I have a favourite one, but yeah, uh, he was uh, he was fun. I enjoyed, I enjoyed enjoyed writing him. I bet you can guess my next question is who was the most challenging? Um, yes, Guillaume. That's what I was going to get. Guillaume. Yeah, Guillaume yes, was, was had he he was troublesome, <laughs> pesky pesky painter. Um, yeah, it's a you know he he just took a little longer. You know, I, I this organic writing, I guess. You know, you I, I wait for the characters really to emerge on the page as I write them. Um, I don't have. I mean, I, I'll have notes about what I think is going to happen and what I think their certain characteristics are. But only when I actually sit down and start writing do I really discover um, who they are. And he took longer to materialize on the page for me. Um, so yeah, he was. Uh, he was. He was. He was a challenge. Yeah, you know, smoke and fire are also themes in the book. Those were themes that I was seeing. And as I was rereading many folded down pages, I don't have my galley here, but I have many folded down pages I was going through this morning. I saw there were mentions throughout that I had folded down pages of mentions of, including that the oven was used to warm Proust's clothes, which I thought was like a really fun fact you must have found. And I'm so glad you dropped it in there. <laughs> and the smoke and fire will have something that happens later on in the book that will have some, but it was throughout the story there were all kinds of moments where you were seeing that. So I just want you to know, I did pick up on this theme that was resonating and it, because you knew something was going to happen, but you couldn't figure out what. And some of it was into backstory and some of it was, well, where's this going, going forward? So was I a clever reader? <laughs> Very clever. Yes. No, you get a gold star for that. <laughs> circle all the pages, like it being in school, circle all the pages with fire or something to do with heat on them. <laughs> rest of the class you know if you have all hundred you win no, okay. so each of the none of the characters were famous though famous you know people swirled in and out we talked about how you were really into writing about these ordinary people but you also touch on race here and what race meant and um you know we've got josephine baker that we do first we're talking about what it means to be not white but then with someone her blurring the color lines and who she could be 
in Paris that you really couldn't be in the States quite the same way. Right. And I think it was different for people in the community there, but I think it's something that we don't think about a lot. We know what ha happened here. Was Paris more open? Was everything different there? Because I think mm -hmm. it's something very powerful you brought out in these pages. Much, much more open. Uh, and, I, and I hope that I, I did bring that out. I mean, you know, there's when Josephine Baker is being interviewed by Jean-Paul, she talks about when she was on the boat coming over with, with a, a troupe of African-American artists who were coming from America to, to France. Um, and although they were a very prestigious group, they were not, you know, they were not allowed to be in the first class compartments because they're African-Americans. Uh, and so it was just the, the same old story of discrimination that they, they were used to. But then they arrived in Paris and they were treated just like ordinary people. And uh, there's a reason why uh, she stayed. There's a reason why Sidney Bechet was in, was in Paris. And, uh, and you think about people like James Baldwin, or even if you fast forward 30 years, Miles Davis. You know, he went to Paris as a jazz musician and was just astonished at how the treatment that he was used to uh, in in America just didn't exist uh, in, in France. And it, I think it was a very uh, liberating uh, experience for a lot, a lot of African-Americans who came over. Um, yeah, so, and it, that was something that I sure wanted to, wanted to talk about and sort of shine a light on. Yeah, so um, this ending that I loved, <laughs> you didn't know about that ending at the beginning. And I've done some reading that that came later. much, much later. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, it did. Um, uh, it did. And we had actually sold the book um, uh, before that ending was done. And I was sitting down with my editor. Uh, we were in Memphis, actually, at the Winter Institute there a couple of years ago. Uh, and Amy had just bought it. And we were sitting down and having one of these long conversations about the book. And she was going, well, I think we're not this and we're not this. And then she said this thing. And she said, well, have you thought, what about... I don't, I don't want to say what it is, but she said, blah, 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 blah. And I thought, oh, that's funny. She's, um, she's got those two characters confused. And I said, you've got those two characters confused. And she said, no, I didn't. Uh, and, and I thought, and then this light bulb went off. And I thought, oh, that's genius. And so, um, so that was kind of where it came from. So I, unfortunately, I can't take very much credit for it. <laughs> but then did you have to go back and write backwards? Oh, yeah. Then I had to, then there was a nine-month rewriting that, that was required in order to, to make it work. Um, so there was a lot of work to do, but, but it was completely worth it because it, it, it was just one of those moments. I mean, you know, I don't think writers get many in their careers, but it, when just... I thought, oh, yes, that's so good. <laughs> exactly, exactly. You know, the tagline is one day in the city of light, like that you've been, been talking about, and one night in search of lost time. And time very much plays a part here. I feel like I heard the clock ticking the whole time mm. I was there because you knew it was a day. And as we were getting closer to evening and closer into night, you knew something was going to happen. Was the clock ticking like in your head of like how you were laying this out to get you, I mean, it has to get to the end of the day, but you can't have a lag at four o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah, it, it was. And that was, again, one of the challenges of the thing. Uh, and, and being able to, or trying to sort of spread the action out so that it was constant throughout the day. But also I was very aware of this idea that there was this climax that everybody sort of, you know, knows is coming uh, and so it was an interesting challenge in terms of pacing as well um, and the book starts off gently uh, not a lot happens but but as we as we move through the day and as all of these different narratives acquire their own momentum it does get quicker and quicker and quicker and by the end and so I mentioned the um, the, the, the alternating chapters. And then that the last chapter of the book is a very long chapter. Most of the chapters are very, very short. And what I did was, was to, again, compress so that each of the four characters' points of view are being told still in the same strict order, mm -hmm. but literally maybe a paragraph or two instead of a chapter. And so the, the pace just got quicker and quicker and quicker. And my, my, what I was really trying to do, which is something that I've never done before in any of my books, was to make it a, I mean, a literal page turner. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that people just w weren't actually able to put it down. Um, and it's been nice because a lot of people have said exactly that. And they said, so by the end, I couldn't, 
you know, had to, to postpone things. <laughs> which is... I, say, I did not get a lot done this morning finishing reading the book. <laughs> I just had the right to... <laughs> this is like really good. Oh my gosh. There's also a scene where the acrobats are performing and there's a line there about being there being no safety net. And yes. for most of these characters, I'm seeing that there's a lack of balance and a lack of a safety net. And I think that the metaphor there of what was going on with the acrobats was so interesting because mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it was um, also a lot of missed chances. There was a, a, a sliding doors kind of aspect to this whole book, because if you had gone this way, something else would have happened. And we, the reader, are saying, but if you only, but no, there's this time, you know, you can't make this thing happen. Um, I think that people are going to ponder a lot of the missed chances that were in here. And I could see book groups having fun talking about the missed chances that you put in there. I hope so. I mean, I think that that's all, you know, it's one of the eternal things that we all think about, you know, just the, the road not taken. And uh, um, and so, yeah, it, I mean, that's always been something I've been interested in. And, you know, we only get one shot at this and where, where are we going to go? And, and again, having four characters and putting it all in one day, everything got very condensed. So there was a lot of it. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's very much, I, I mean, I think it's, a, it's an, an eternally fascinating question. Yeah, and the acrobats, like it, all you got to do is go like this and you miss. All, you have to be just that fraction of a bit off. And I think that all these people's lives were a fraction of a bit off of finding happiness. Yeah. And it was, you know, like, what were they doing to try to find it? We're also between wars here, and everybody's talking about prior suffering, but from the vantage point of us as a reader, we know what's coming next, and we realize this moment of gaiety is just a moment. It's, a, it's going to be gone very, very soon, and I think that was very interesting to be using this particular time period because it was still a time of recovery in a lot of ways. We were moving towards another place, but I think that you place these characters in a very special place and time for them, but we know what's coming. And I think that that was always in the back of my head. Where will these people be in 10 years? Right, right. Yeah, and it was, it was an interesting time to set the book. I mean, as I said, there was a very specific reason for it, but there are so many books written about Paris and there are so many books written about Paris during World War II in particular. Um, and not that I deliberately chose not to do that, um, but, but it, was, it was really only after I began that I realized that there was a whole other work over here of people doing that um and nothing against them at all i mean it, it was an incredible time i mean I, I i totally understand why people do it i mean just the idea that you have such clearly defined good guys and bad guys and you know uh, so um it so it was yeah you're right there was it was a sort of in between time and and yes we as readers know what is coming uh, even if the characters don't, and and it, it does cast um, uh, a, a shadow, I think, over over all of it. Yeah. So you write in um, Paris in a way that's not just a love letter to a tourist, but somebody who lived there. And I know you lived there. I believe it was twice. Were you living there, or once, or? Yeah. Well, so I went to school there when I was thirteen uh, in a, a little suburb in a boarding school in the north of Paris called Pontoise, and then I lived there for a year working as an attorney uh, in a law firm. So I've, yeah, I've lived there a couple of times. But I also read this somewhere that you've never visited the Eiffel Tower, is that true? Oh no, that's not quite true. I have, oh, okay. I, mean, I, okay. I, took, I took my children there a few years ago. Mm -hmm. um, but while I lived there, I didn't. Um, mm -hmm. That was, and, and I'd never met anybody who had ever gone. I mean, it was, it is one of those things that um, is, you know, really for tourists, and 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 it's one. It was one of the fun things, but also one of the challenges about writing about Paris was everybody thinks they know what mm -hmm. Paris is like, um, and I wanted to show them a different kind of city uh, with bits that maybe they weren't aware of. But by the same token, there's a balance to be struck because you don't want to show them something so outlandish that they don't recognize it at all so there is a there is a, a, a balance and um i really just wrote about the places that i like you know i used to live in the in the in on the left bank uh for most of the time that i was there and so i said a lot of it around there just because it was kind of fun and i would sort of go back in, in my head and remember where i used to live and go onto google maps and sort of zoom down the streets <laughs> it, was, it was fun it was it's all the things it. you can do like with google maps you, you don't have to go you don't have to be there you can take your memories and then start drawing from there so you know years ago things, speaking of you know like not doing things 
we'd never taken the boys up to the, um, the Empire State Building. So I was in the city with them one day and they go, can we go do this? And it's one of those things like, yeah, I pay cash and I had like zero cash on me. Like we had enough just to get us up to the Empire State Building. And we got up and we were looking down and the boys go, there's the World Trade Center. Why don't we go do that too? And I said, oh, we'll do that another time. It was 2001. Never got to take them up. And when I was reading this and I was thinking about, you know, people who don't go do things even in their own cities, they... Right after 9-11, they both turned to me and said, remember that day we were going to go up to the building? And I was like, yes, I clearly do. You know, I totally remember that. So there's those moments that you're in your own city and you have tourists come in and they start telling you about things they've done and places they've gone. And you know the great bistro down the corner and they're telling you about the five-star restaurant. And you're going, but really, the bistro is what you're looking for. Right, right. So, that, that, yes, and a lot of people sort of have asked me about questions about um uh you know where do i like to eat and this and that and my you're exactly right carol i don't have a favorite restaurant in paris i just like to go to the place on the corner right and that's the joy for me uh is is is, is that for sure they've got great onion soup or they've got great this or great that and i don't need the whole five course meal right. so did you go to paris for this book at all or were you doing all your research um, or by the internet uh, I mean, I didn't, I did, most of the research was just in books, actually, and just, just reading um, books about Proust. And I mean, lots of, you know, every, all of the people who, who are there, I um, did research and read biographies, of course, and those sorts of things. Um, I did, during the course of writing the book, I went twice. I went once with my wife. So hard, so hard, was, such a hard time to it was, do it was that, terrible. really. Like, it was awful, but you know, I struggled through and it was, she was actually going to a conference and I just sort of tagged along. And then last summer I took my children and uh, I got my daughter to sort of follow me around, taping me, doing various things and sort of, you know, well, this is, I sort of stood outside Proust's apartment and did a little thing. And so that was kind of fun. Do you um, those up on your website? Remind me. Do you, are those up on your website or were those the people? Uh, that they're, they're on my, uh, my Instagram feed. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, yeah. But we'll link to that. We'll link to that. Yeah. So, you know, I've always meant to ask you, what prompted you to move to the States? I've known you all these years. And to Columbia, Missouri. Like, what prompted that at the beginning? I don't remember you were an attorney there. I do remember that. Yeah. So, um, so excuse me. <coughs> so I came to America um, because of a woman, probably rather predictably. Um, I, uh, and in fact, we met in Paris uh, when I was working there as an attorney. And uh, she was as she used to put it at the Sorbonne, pretending to learn French. Uh, she, she actually lived in Boston at the time, and then she moved to New York, and then we actually re-met at somebody's wedding who had also been in Paris. Um, and then we spent six months, this is a very long and boring story, Carol. <laughs> we, we dated for six months, then we got married in New York, uh, lived in London for several years, and um, then we came back to Missouri in 2003 because that is where she was originally from. Oh, okay. So that is that is why I'm here. That's why you're there. So mm -hmm. there you go. So in the book, there's this great line from a priest where he says, every once in a while, you have to make a leap into the unknown. To do that, you have to have a little faith. And I feel like you've done that just a few times <laughs> in your life. Am I right? Including when you decided to start a bookstore. So Skylark Bookstore in Columbia. So just tell us about where that idea came from. I remember being at a Winter Institute, which is where the indie booksellers all get together and talk about ideas. And you were thinking about it then and you were book, book Expo thinking about it. So how much thinking went in before you said, oh yeah, I could do this? Oh, a lot. I mean, the, the, the reason why I ended up doing it, apart from the fact that it's just the best thing ever, um, was that, so you had mentioned in your very nice introduction that I also run this book festival called the Unbound Book Festival. And we've done five of those. We actually just had, well, we just had to cancel our fifth one. It was supposed to be a few weeks ago. Um, but the, the response from the community has been absolutely overwhelming. Uh, people have just adored it and they've been very supportive. And we've had some, I mean, we've had George Saunders and Salman Rushdie and Michael and Dace and Zadie Smith. So we've had some unbelievable people who've come to the middle of Missouri to talk to us. Um, but the, the enthusiasm that that whole endeavor was met with uh, made me think, because there isn't a, a, an independent bookstore that sells new books in town. 
Uh, and I just thought, well, this, and a lot of people were going, what? why isn't there one? And I thought, well, that's a very good question. Uh, and there used to be three back in when I arrived in 2003, but they all closed oh, down. Wow. And so I just thought, well, this is an opportunity. And the, the success of the festival was really what made me think that it might be a good idea. And I don't know whether it is a good idea, but what I can tell you is that I'm having the most fun mm -hmm. that I've ever, I've ever had, even, the, even in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, it's, it's, it's great. I love it. I know the feeling. I started this company 24 years ago and I still have a great time. And as long as you're still having a great time, it super matters because you can throw that enthusiasm back into what you're doing. And sure. what has owning a bookstore impacted your writing at all? In meaning that you're seeing the way people discover, you're seeing, is there anything you're learning from the people that come into your store? Oh, uh, probably. I, uh, yes. I mean, I'm learning a lot about how people browse and how they shop and everyone's different. Some people walk in with a list and they know exactly what they want. And some people uh, want to engage you as the minute they step in the door and say, Oh, I like this. I really enjoyed this. Have you got any? And then there are other people who do not want anything to do with you. And they just want to be left alone to sort of pull the books off. And read. So there's, there's such a variety of ways in which people discover books. Uh, so that was very interesting. Um, whether it's impacted on my writing or not, I probably not. Um, uh, it's it's at least not in, not in terms of what I write. It, it's impacted how much time you have to write, maybe. I have to write. Just, I have less time than I used to have people. You know. Yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, I'm. You know, I've begun my new book now, and I'm back on the. I mean, I've I've always written in the early morning because I've always had other jobs, uh, but I'm back on the five o'clock starts now, and. Um, it's uh, yeah. After the end of the day, I was talking about falling, you know, falling asleep with a book and the book hitting me. I'm like, That's why it's because I wake up very early to squeeze it all in. Well, I know I've been staying up very late as well, and I've been, and I, but if I'm reading and I drop the book on the floor, my impetus is not to leave it there and keep sleeping. It's to pick the book up and keep reading. Of I do that like three and four times. I drop the book and I'm like, wait a second, you really need to get with your program a little bit more here. <laughs> the idea is leave it and keep sleeping. So yeah, it's really funny. Did you, um, there are other authors who have run bookstores. I'm thinking of Ann Patchett and Emma Straub, like off the top of my head. Yeah. Do you guys talk? I mean, I think it'd be a great panel at Winter Institute as authors who are booksellers. I think it'd be great because it's, what you actually do see of people coming into the store. I mean, my sister's during the pandemic going crazy because she can't listen to me about what to read. She feels that she has to go to the store and browse around or go to the library and browse around and she can't do that so she can't read. So right. I was like, how about if I just told you something? No, not the same. So. Yeah, it, no, I mean, we, we don't. I mean, I, I've, I've met Anne um, and uh, I haven't met um, Emma, although funnily enough, her book came out the same day that mine did. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and there was talk about doing something together but but it, we we you know she's very busy so we couldn't make it work um but i i think it would be a it would be an interesting panel and there there are there are others as well of course um, yeah. and danny kane at the raven is a poet and he owns that store and uh, louise erdrick of mm -hmm. course so so there's a there's a, a a rich um tradition that i'm very proud to be <laughs> to be part of it's a it's it's tremendous fun uh and yeah and there's something special about selling your own book as well which is, mm -hmm. which is which is kind of fun i'm getting better at it to begin with i was sort of it, i told the staff well don't put them face out they'll just sit there on the spine under the no gym. way no way <laughs> uh, anyway so I over the no one from the publisher is listening to this <laughs> meanwhile i love that emma had all the books in the window were hers and i was like yes do that moment that's why you have the rent that's why you have everything so you have a display unit for your books it was great well, on the day that's we did that too we did okay. that too. yeah um so but you know but it's i mean and it's been an interesting thing to publish during this time and you know we had grand plans to fill the place with friends and have a big party and of course we weren't able to do any of that but you know there's still a lot of joy to be had and, and a lot of silver linings to be to be um, enjoyed so um, it's it's not the launch that anybody had expected but it's still it's still been been fun and those four like the four letter word zoom has gotten you to a lot of other places you know <laughs> yes. I was in a discussion we were with um, Megway Clayton a couple of weeks ago yeah. and um, 
uh, let's face her name, Wait, Whitney Cher, the two of you were together. And it was, the three of you were together, and it was a great conversation. And it's the kind of thing where you could have done it in the festival, but everybody can't be all these places. And what we're hearing from our readers a lot is that they're able to go to more now. They're able to hear yeah. from more authors than ever before because it was seven o'clock on Wednesday and they had this with their kids or they had this going on and they couldn't get there. They hit traffic. They did this. And even for all the events that are in New York, I don't go to everything. I don't have time to go, yeah. but to be able to go back and watch these recorded and to be able to watch what's going on and sort of been flipping readers along to those a lot because I'm, this is what you might've missed, but I think it's great and I think you should see it. Yeah, and, we, and we, we realized that very quickly when, you know, we were obviously sad that we couldn't put the festival on as we had originally envisaged it, but suddenly you see the benefits of doing this online stuff. And there's nothing that's quite going to meet the same, the same sort of uh, uh, energy of everyone being in the room together. But suddenly we were doing these events and there were people from both coasts and everywhere else who were, who were tuning in to, to listen. And and it, that was an opportunity that we wouldn't have had. So when we talk about silver linings, those kinds of things, yeah. uh, absolutely. And I've been able to, you know, my, my tours was cancelled, of course, but I've been able to, to still speak mm -hmm. um, you know, everywhere. So, so um, I feel, you know, I, I feel lucky. And I think that it's going to change the way that we do things now. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I, uh, yeah, a mighty blaze, you know, Carolyn Levitt and Jenna right. Blum put this incredible thing together, which, and I've been involved in that a little bit. And it's been so interesting to watch. And I, I do think that it's going to change. It's going to take a while for it all to sort of everyone to calm down and see what happens. But I do think that things are going to change hugely. Yeah, the big discovery moment of what's going to happen and, yeah. you know, what's going to go on. Um, I, yeah, I did, a couple of weeks ago, I said to my husband, we're having dinner tonight with Stephen King and John Grisham. He looks at me and there was the laptop at the end of the table and we were having dinner and they were at the table and I said, so we had dinner with them, you know, it didn't cost $500 a plate. <laughs> <laughs> even more fun. So do you still practice law at all? Or is that like something you only do between what nine and like nine 30 in the morning? <laughs> you know, the window. I know I do. I do. Um, still doing that. Uh, and, um, you know, it's sort of, it's, it keeps me busy and, uh, and it keeps me grounded. It's, it's so different from everything else that I do um, that I don't think it's a bad thing to have that other sort of string to my bow. Uh, uh, and you Stay know, forward writing, stay forward writing. You can't sit there and invent. It's gotta be the facts, <laughs> just the facts. <laughs> well, it's, you know, and, and, and people often ask me about the, the difference between writing fiction and writing sort of estate planning documents, which is what I do. Um, and, and I always say, well, I, and, people say, so do they complement each other? And the answer is, well, no, not at all. They're actually precise opposites. Because when I'm drafting a legal document, my job is to put down what the client wants and for there to be absolutely zero chance of uh, misunderstanding or ambiguity, as opposed to writing a novel when the reverse is true and you want to put words down on a page and hopefully send your reader in their imagination off on whatever flights wherever it takes them so they couldn't be more different and uh, i kind of like that i like the fact that they are like chalk and cheese yeah because i was going to ask you like how it influences but if there are so different that you feel like i've done this now i can go be creative and now if i'm stuck in creative land let me go over to be facts just the facts just the facts right. so. yeah so what's next? Let's see. Wait, wait. In between promoting this book, running the bookstore, the festival, and being a lawyer, what book are you writing next? Like, what am I going to read next? Uh, early well, days? It's very early days. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm on chapter two. I wrote the first chapter and then stopped for a long time. And I've just begun again. Um, but I had actually, this is my third time out. I um I began something in the summer and wrote 15,000 words and then began something else in January and wrote 5,000 words and I just, just dropped them because the, the, the speed at which I write, Carol, which is incredibly slowly, means that you know I've got to, and I was talking to um, uh, Christina Baker Klein about this and she said it's like spidey sense and like you really know when there's a thing that is gonna keep you Engage, mm -hmm. as a writer engaged and passionate uh, and it needs to be really really good if you're going to be doing it for years the way that I do and so I began these two things and thought oh this is good and then it just it didn't it wasn't sustainable that mm -hmm. that sort of energy and excitement so I dropped him I mean I'm old enough and ugly enough to know when things aren't working so like oh, try something else so I've got a, a new thing which I, I I think this is probably the one um, I have no idea 
um, I, I know what it's about, but I don't know how long it's going to take or what it's going to look like. But I'm, I'm excited. I'm still in that, that honeymoon period, so I'm enjoying it. Well, I hung out with you since 2012. There was a book in the middle, which I didn't have a copy of in the office, Setting Free the Kites. So it's not like I'm not loyal over eight years to remembering that like I could go to the office. And it's funny because I was packing up some books and I was putting them in bags. I was like, wait, that was 2012? Why did I think he wrote that a lot later, like 15 or something? And I was like, oh, wait a second, let me go back. Is it 2000, was it 2012? Or it was, was it? Yeah, February 2012. I was right, I went to the right bag. So <laughs> look, it's always wonderful to talk to you. It's wonderful to see you. I'm so glad we had this book to talk about for the readers. It's such a treat. And it's a treat also because it's a slim, impactful novel. Slim folks, for everybody who's sitting there going doorstopper, not, not doorstopper. But it's also this, um, it's a beautiful read at the same time and it's gonna take you someplace else. And I think that you are right. We wanna be transported at this time. Mm -hmm. So. Thank you for joining us. Lots of luck with the store, and I really hope to see you soon. Thank you, Carol. Take care. It's great to talk to you. Great. See you soon. Bye. And for everyone else, we'll see you next time.